The harbour is the shrine of Sydney's water and sunshine worshippers. Its bays and beaches, spearing into the city's heart, breathe a fresh air vitality into the whole way of life. If you look around, there's something for just about everyone. Sydney Harbour's sheltered waters are a marvellous training arena for sailors of all ages. Although it's still quite easy to stumble. Every day, the harbour parades an infinite variety of craft as commerce and pleasure vie for the use of its sparkling waters. But on one day each year, precisely on time, the harbour is given over briefly by the pleasure boat sailors for its greatest spectacle, the start of the Sydney Hobart Yacht Race. Commodore Joe Diamond briefs crews in the 1974 race at the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia's clubhouse. Now what we lack in numbers this year, we're certainly making up in quality. Uh, the, the race for line honours is going to be a fantastic race, which I'm sure everyone will take a tremendous interest in. But the, the, there's a, a, another tremendous interest in it, is in our new Admiral's Cup boats. And I'm sure this is going to be a fantastic race between these magnificent new boats. And then the third contingent we have is our level rating group, which is the one tonners and half tonners. And having a small boat myself, I think that these people that, that, that really need the accolade because after Ondine and etc. etc. have been in there in three days, they'll probably be battling it out for possibly first place on New Year's Day. And this could happen. So welcome all. I'm sure it's going to be a magnificent race. Uh, the, 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 the briefing here is quite complete. I wish you all the best of luck and I'll see you all in Hobart. <laughs> Day, December the 26th, and the last minute bustle at the Cruising Yacht Club in Rushcutters Bay finally takes purpose. The yachts begin to peel from their marina berths and head out to the starting line. There are 63 starters this year, fewer than the year before but public interest in the race has never been keener, and a large spectator fleet gathers for the start. There is little wind. It's blowing from the east, encouraging yachts to start near the eastern shore, and this is where the spectator boats are most densely packed. Everything that floats is out there, and some that shouldn't. Right from the starting gun, Bumblebee 3, the favourite for the handicap honours, accelerates from the fleet. Small boats and some very big boats block the course to the heads. The ship has broken down just before the start and is forced to moor hurriedly right in front of the yachts. Ondine, biggest yacht in the race, decides to pass behind her. Ballyhoo edges past love and war. Both crews tense, coaxing those last fractions of speed from the weakest of winds. There's terrible interference to wind and water as the spectator fleet breaks past the patrol boats along the eastern shore. Ballyhoo, gathering speed from a slow start, slides past Buccaneer. Despite the light winds, it's an eventful start. Bumblebee aground, an outlying peak of the Sound Pigs Reef. She's stopped dead, losing a lead of 200 yards, but fortunately she suffers no damage. Helsel, the race record holder, is finding the breeze too light. Aboard Ballyhoo, Jack Rooklin puffs up as his yacht wins the prestige of being first through the heads. Close by, the new ragamuffin tacks away towards North Head. Ondine battles for clear air and clear water as thoughtless spectator craft buzz about her.
she tacks again in the frustrating struggle to reach the open sea. Ballyhoo is doing best of all in the light wind, big swell and confused chop stirred up by the spectator boats, and she begins to lope away. Patrice 3, her mainsail made from the revolutionary Kevlar carbon fibre reinforced cloth. It looks good at this stage. Ballyhoo is leading but taking no chances. She tacks again to cover her big American rival Ondine. But Ondine is now starting to move too. The 22-man crew of Huey Long's 79-foot catch settle into working her complicated sail handling systems and she is responding with speed. But for Buccaneer, the 73-foot plywood New Zealander, line honours winner in 1970, the breeze is just too light. Into the open sea at last, the spectators left behind. Apollo 3. Alan Bond's new 54-footer leads Volante and Mercedes 4, which has done very well through the light joggle of the first two hours. But further ahead, Ballyhoo picks up speed and soon races to a clear half-mile lead in freshening wind. She's a 73-footer, newly launched, designed by Bob Miller for Rooklyn of Sydney to take on the world's biggest yachts. Disappointing in her early races, the Hobart is her first big chance to prove herself. As the afternoon wears on, the breeze frees enough for spinnakers to be set. After one of the slowest starts in years, the fleet settles down and is on its way. Darkness falls, Ballyhoo is two miles ahead of Ondine, with another mile to Bumblebee 3, followed by Buccaneer. A night and a morning of light wind and calms follow. But on the afternoon of December 27, the northeast sea breeze fills in and Bumblebee 3 shows the speed that has won her five races in five starts. Love and War, a consistent 47-footer, also enjoys the spinnaker reach. But further down the coast, Ondine would like more wind. Fisher's new ragamuffin carves a clear, fast track for Hobart. She's another new Miller design intent on proving herself. Her hopes in this race are to be shattered in Bass Strait two days from now when she breaks an intermediate stay and has to turn back for home. Patrice 3, also preparing for the Admiral's Cup trials. Although the yachts are far out to sea, many thousands of people ashore follow the progress of the race. Three times a day, the Caltex radio relay ship collects the positions of every yacht. It then transmits their latitudes and longitudes ashore to a specially prepared system, first to Sydney Radio. Then the message goes to an exclusive switchboard link in the General Post Office. This transmits the position simultaneously to the race headquarters of the Cruising Yacht Club of Australia in Sydney and the Royal Yacht Club of Tasmania in Hobart. At the 
cruising yacht club press centre, the position of every yacht in the race is plotted on a master chart. Reports are prepared for newspapers, television, radio. And hundreds of telephone inquiries from friends and families of sailors in the race are handled. A complete picture of the race is available within minutes thanks to a computer link across the world. Positions are fed into a Honeywell computer terminal which instantly sends them via satellite to a computer in Cleveland, USA. Within seconds, progressive reports are flashed back to terminals in the press centre. At the Royal Yacht Club of Hobart, they also plot the positions and wait for the finish. On December the 28th, the third day of the race, the wind plays many tricks. Some of the yachts are sailing in a light sou'easter. Among them is the new three-quarter tonner Matika, skippered by CYC rear commodore Tony Pearson. At this point, she is running fifth on handicap in Division C, which is packed with well-prepared one-tonners and three-quarter tonners. Jack Rooklin has given his previous yacht, the slender 57-footer Apollo, over to his 18-year-old son Warwick to skip her in this race. Apollo is five years old and has raced many thousands of miles, but there's life in her yet. Her crew know that with luck, they could be in the final fight for line honours. Their concentration is intense and muscles willing as the big headsails are ground in. Further ahead, Ondine has sailed into New Breeze, the westerly the whole fleet has been waiting for. For the first time, the shallow, lightweight is able to gain maximum drive from the spread of sail in her lofty catch rig. Ballyhoo springs sheets for the westerly too and screams away. She's still almost level with Ondine. But for most, before the westerly system firms, the day is one of frustration, battling light and changing wind patterns. Bumblebee 3 is still strongly placed for a corrected time win. But she's lost some of her edge on both Patrice 3 and Love and War. War at 1 p.m. is leading the race on handicap. But race fortunes are changing quickly between the winds. The Cole 43 Ruffian is back in the middle of the fleet and the plywood sloop Hustler needs more wind. By evening, the half-tonner Gum Blossom is handicap leader from the Division C yachts Alibaba and Pintado. The race is slow progress favouring these smaller yachts, but the race is far from won. The weather advantage goes back to the big yachts as the westerly builds to gale force, gusting to 50 knots during the night and early morning of the 29th. It's so rough that radio communications with the fleet are disrupted. But as the radio positions come through later, Omdi emerges as clear race leader off the Tasmanian coast, 35 miles ahead of Ballyhoo. Ballyhoo lost ground in the blow. She broached under Spinnaker and lay flat on her side, mast nearly in the water. She recovered when the crew were forced to cut the Spinnaker halyard away. But then she had to run for 12 hours in the westerly gale with only a tiny number two jib. As the westerly eases, she's back to full sail and has closed to within 20 miles of Ondi. Bumblebee 3, working hard another 56 miles behind Ballyhoo. Apollo 3 broke her steering system during the blow. She has struggled on under emergency tiller steering for eight hours while repairs were made, and she has recovered well.
Bumblebee 3 has languished for seven hours in a calm off the Tasmanian coast. This has cost her her position of third in the fleet. Buccaneer, Helsel and Apollo have caught her, and Apollo 3 has popped up over the horizon astern. But John Kalbetzer and his crew are still working hard for a corrected time win as the yacht heels again to a freshening sou'wester. The race for the handicap prize is still far from decided. But there's no doubt now that Ondine must win line honours. Huey Long has competed in the Sydney Hobart race with three Ondines. The first, a 57-footer, set a race record in 1962 that remained unbroken until 1973. The newest Ondine was built to break records and chase line honours in races all over the world. But with this race the slowest for many years, records are out of the question. With the leaders nearing the finishing line, the Caltex radio relay ship South Pacific keeps its listening watch on the main body of the fleet off the Tasmanian coast. The westerly has abated, but has shifted to the southwest, giving a hard, wet punch around the Tasmanian coast. Commodore Joe Diamond's duet is battling for a place in Division C. By evening of the 29th, the overall handicap leader is reckoned to be Victoria from Love and War and the new Tasmanian one-tonner, Q and Chief. Love and War leads in Division A, Victoria in Division B, Q and Chief in Division C and Cavalier in Division D. It's after 1am as Ondi nears the finishing line in the River Derwent. The helmsman, Warwick Tompkins, waves the photographer's spotlight forward onto the giant Genoa jib so he can see the sail by its light and steer to keep it working effectively. Ondine finishes at 1.52 a.m. on December the 30th. And as the crew tidies up after 630 miles of non-stop effort and concentration, they are suddenly aware that 2,000 people from yachting happy Hobart town have stayed up to cheer them in. Ballyhoo finishes, three hours later. She has had a good race and her owner celebrates with a cigar. He is pleased and reassured that his yacht can pace it with the world's best. He plans a modification, adding more lead ballast to the keel. He intends to take the yacht to Los Angeles for the Transpac race to Honolulu to clash again with Ondine. The wind is quiet in Storm Bay and the Derwent through the morning of the 30th. Buccaneer is in the river, heading for the finish. And outside in Storm Bay, Helsel has sailed around both Apollo and Bumblebee 3. Buccaneer drifts across the finishing line with little more wind than she had at the start to finish third. the Tasmanian coast, there's still more wind than many yachts need, and the race-weary crews are kept busy changing sail. The computer shows Love and War to be the handicap leader from Mercedes 4, Victoria, Granny Smith and Bumblebee 3. Love and War leads Division A, Victoria Division B, Dorothy 2 Division C and Granny Smith Division D. There's an interesting big yacht finishing duel in the river. Kelsall pops up a magnificent star-cut spinnaker as she fights off Apollo. Apollo has closed up rapidly on Helsall in the smooth water and is renowned for her speed under spinnaker. But Helsall, unique for her fellow cement construction, makes it. Apollo has proved she's no has-been. She's done well in a race that did not really suit her long, shallow hull form. The light winds of the first two days virtually killed her chances. Apollo's crew also has the satisfaction of beating their main rival for line honours in Sydney racing, Bumblebee 3.
And here comes Bumblebee 3, wound up and going like an express train, recording incredible speed in the light wind. Ability to accelerate and keep moving in light winds have won her many a race, but in this race, she suffered two prolonged periods of calm, one of six hours, the other three. The crew, reflecting on the race, wonder if their efforts, the sleepless hours of sailing and their 111 sail changes during the race, have been enough to win it for them despite the time lost in the calms. The boat they fear most, well positioned through every radio hookup, has been Peter Kurt's Love and War. And sure enough, the hard sailed Love and War does beat them, and the news is she looks like being outright handicapped winner too as well-wishers swarm aboard for a celebration. Up to the minute results are available for crews and spectators from the busy Caltech Information Centre at Constitution Dock. The centre also passes on hundreds of messages and telegrams to the yachtsmen. Fantasy Rag. Sid Fisher's old ragamuffin, now owned by Jack Musgrove of Melbourne, sails an excellent race to finish fifth on corrected time. It's dark before Patrice limps in. Her Kevlar mainsail split off the Tasmanian coast and she's had to crawl the last 11 hours of the race under a storm trysail. Still, it's been a good race for Patrice 3. Despite the mishap, she's placed eighth on corrected time. finish thick and fast on the morning of December 31st. Among them is the Tasmanian Hugh and Chief, fighting for the lead in Division C with Brutofacia from Western Australia. Both are new yachts of the one-ton cup class. Hugh and Chief beats Brutofacia across the finishing line by less than two minutes. So close, after 630 miles. That beer is well deserved. Although they're the first one-tonners to finish, Division C has yet to be decided. Duet and Wild Goose are only yards apart. And another one-tonner, Bushwhacker, is not far ahead. Division A has been won already by Love and War and Division B by Victorian yacht Vittoria. The eventual winner of Division C is the Sydney three-quarter turner, Poitrell II, from Appaloosa. Bushwhack attacks to cover her pursuers. The Tasmanian three-quarter turner, Nike. She finishes third in Division C. Division D for the smallest yachts is the last to be decided. Here comes the half-tonner Granny Smith. She may be one of the smallest in the race, but she all but causes the biggest upset. This 30-footer not only wins Division D, but places third overall. With a little more luck rounding Tasman Island, she might have been second. have no luck at all. Among the five yachts to retire from the race is the one-tonner Worry, made helpless by a broken rudder. South Pacific picks up her distress call and takes Worry in tow. They head for the haven of Constitution Dock. Caltex radio relay ship South Pacific, its job well done, births. It's New Year's Eve and the race is over.
On New Year's Day, the Governor of Tasmania, Sir Stanley Burberry and Lady Burberry visit South Pacific to meet the crew and officials of the organising clubs. After leaving the radio relay vessel, His Excellency visited yachts in Constitution Dock and talked to many of the skippers. And after every Hobart race, even the slow ones, there's always plenty to talk about. The official corrected time overall results for the 1974 Sydney Hobart race are, first, love and war. Second, Bumblebee 3. And third, Granny Smith. <laughs>